It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to SMU. Uh, my name is Jim Hollifield and I'm the director of the Tower Center and uh, more importantly, a professor here at SMU. I'm very proud of that. Um, and um, I see you all fought the weather, you fought the parking, you fought the traffic to get over here, so I want to congratulate you on that big accomplishment. So we probably will have some other guests arriving a bit late. Uh, but as you all know, uh, this program is devoted uh, to the Japanese American experience, uh, to the life and accomplishments of Irene Hirano in a way, who is our very distinguished guest. Uh, she will be introduced more formally in, in a few minutes, but um, we are going to have a panel to discuss uh, the Japanese-American experience and the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. Before we actually get started with the program, I just want to recognize a few very special guests who are here, so please hold your applause until I've introduced them. I'll ask them to stand and just remain standing for a moment. Um, we have with us, all the way from Houston, somewhere here, the Consul General of Japan, Mr. Taka Takaoka. <laughs> so much for instructions. I'm not a very good professor. Uh, we also have, fortunately, we don't have very many introductions to make, but we have a brand new uh, diplomat in town, uh, the new representative of Canada, the Consul General of Canada, uh, Miss Sarah Wilshaw, who's here. We also have some new guests with us today uh, who have come, uh, I think, from Michigan, um, also from Southern California. Uh, it's a little company called Toyota, and Miss Nagata, Miss Nagata, who is with the company, let's welcome her. So, you know, in the interest of time, um, I am not going to spend a lot of time uh, introducing everyone. Uh, you have uh, in the program all of their bios. I hope everybody got a copy of the program. Um, and we're going to start the panel with my colleague uh, uh, Hiroki Takayuchi, uh, who is a professor here at SMU and the director of our Sun and Star program. So he will take a few minutes to set the stage. Uh, then we're going to hear from Dr. Annie Wong, who is a senior fellow in the Tower Center, uh, also a colleague uh, who will tell us a little bit more about the Japanese American experience. Uh, and finally on the program, uh, we will have another one of my colleagues, uh, Patrick Walsh, uh, Admiral Patrick Walsh, retired, many of you know uh, Pat, uh, who will talk a little bit about the importance of the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. And then we're going to welcome our special guests to the stage uh, to respond to those uh, remarks. Okay, so Hiroki. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming uh, for the day just before uh, the commencement, 100th uh, commencement of SMU uh, tomorrow, and uh, President George W. Bush will be the speaker. Um, so that's why um, the campus is unusually crowded, and so sorry for the kind of mess of the finding a, a parking lot today. Um, so welcome to the, uh, this academic year's last event at the Tower Center, um, celebrating the American experience and U.S.-Japan relations, Irene Hirano Inoue, her life, works, and achievements. My name is Hiroki Takeuchi, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Sound Star Program on Japan and East Asia in the Tower Center. So this year is the 70th anniversary of ending World War II. Japan has enjoyed the security, stability, and prosperity by participating in the U.S.-led global economy, uh, following U.S.-led international uh, rule of law, and sharing democratic values and system uh, with the United States since World War II. Uh, and that, um, so international rule of law, economic interaction, and democracy are the basis of the, uh, the strong U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. Uh, Prime Minister Abe visited the United States uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I, was, uh, I had an opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, his uh, visit was welcome, and uh, I felt like uh, his visit uh, brought uh, what I would call um, uh, gravitational change. 
uh, to the uh, U.S.-Japan relationship and U.S.-Japan ties have been uh, strengthened. A few years ago, um, Tower Center awarded uh, the Tower Center Medal to uh, President and Mrs. George W. Bush. And his speech, uh, said, he said in his speech that, well, he was uh, the, um, the first person, uh, when 9-11 uh, occurred, the first person who called him, first uh, uh, world leader who called him and offered help was Prime Minister Koizumi. And it was remarkable. Uh, because um, his father, President George H.W. Bush, was fighting against Japan during World War II as an Air Force pilot. Fifty-six years later, his son, President George W. Bush, received a phone call, uh, for the first phone call from the uh, world uh, foreign leader um, after 9-11 for uh, offering help. So U.S.-Japan relationship has changed so uh, drastically. Um, and then that, uh, the strong U.S.-Japan uh, uh, US um, uh, relationship has been based on um, economic interaction, uh, international rule of law, and democracy. And then the recent Abe's visit uh, reassured uh, the uh, strength of the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. However, a strong um, international relationship can never work without human interactions and mutual understanding. Uh, today's guest, uh, Ms. Irene Hirano Inoue, who will receive an uh, honorary doctorate degree uh, of SMU tomorrow uh, in our commencement, she uh, strengthened U.S.-Japan relationship at the uh, grassroots level by serving uh, for more than 35 years in nonprofit administration, community education, and public affairs with culturally diverse groups. I will not uh, go over the bio because uh, um, I have two uh, colleagues, um, uh, co-panelists, uh, who will talk about her achievements. But very briefly, she is the president of U.S. Japan Council, and she administers uh, the Tomodachi Initiative, and uh, she is the former president and founding CEO of the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And then she, was, uh, she held that position for uh, 20 years. So today's, my, today's uh, mission is introducing um, my um, co-panelists, my colleagues of the Tower Center, who are talking about um, Ms. Inoue's uh, achievements. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Uh, Annie Wong. Um, she is a research fellow of the um, Tower Center at the SMU. Uh, my colleague, uh, political scientist, and she uh, was a uh, um, political scientist at Rand Corporation in Arlington, Virginia, uh, before joining the Tower Center. And she, also still, con uh, she, she still continues to consult at Rand, the World Bank, uh, Freedom House, and other organizations. And perhaps most importantly, her, uh, she got a PhD from University of Hawaii at Manor, an east-west center, which um, Ms. Inoue and her uh, uh, late uh, husband, um, Senator Daniel Inoue, um, contributed tremendously uh, for, the, um, um, for, the, uh, for the center. Um, the second speaker uh, will be uh, Admiral Patrick Walsh, um, also my colleague at the Tower Center, uh, former commander of the Pacific Fleet, who uh, operated uh, Operation Tomodachi uh, in 2011 when um, uh, the uh, Earth, uh, 311 earthquake uh, occurred uh, in Japan. Um, well, formal bio, um, you, can, uh, you can see it uh, in, the, in your bio. One thing I would like to add is um, actually Patrick, uh, um, Admiral Walsh is not just Admiral, but also doctor. He received a PhD of international relations uh, from Tufts University. Uh, in Japanese, it's called the uh, um, there's a, a phrase called bun bu ryodo, uh, which means uh, uh, bun and bu means like, uh, like bun means literature, um, education, um, and culture. Bu means force, power, and army. And um, so the bun bu ryodo means doing both. And then he is the model of um, uh, bun bu ryodo. So um, I would call um, 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 Admiral and Dr. Uh, Patrick Walsh. Um, so um, before, um, so um, I can uh, go on and on, but then I will uh, pass my stage to um, 
uh, my colleagues, um, my um, co-panelists. So the first, um, um, Dr. Wong. Okay. Thank you very much, Hiroki. It is my great pleasure and honor to help welcome Mrs. Irene Hirano Inoue to SMU in Dallas. I'm not sure I'd really be here today if it wasn't for her late husband, the Senator Daniel, Daniel Inoue. The Senator was, as Hiroki mentioned, was instrumental in creating the East-West Center in Honolulu. It's a federally funded institution that promotes education, training, and cultural exchange between Americans and people all across the Asia Pacific region. So young people from US and Asia get full scholarships and stipend to take their academic degrees at the University of Hawaii. And at the same time, at the Eastwood Center, we learn about cross-cultural communication. We have classes for that, but much more of that learning occurred in our living quarters, where we ate, drank, and talked, sharing our dreams, our ambitions, learning about each other, where we come from. And all this resulted in lifelong friendships and many unions. So it is in the honor of the late senator that I come here today in my University of Hawaii Aloha shirt <laughs> and to be able to say something about the Japanese American experience, which has greatly educated me and inspired me. I was already studying about Japanese politics and Japanese uh, foreign policy, but being in Hawaii it means you're surrounded by Japanese Americans. And I was learning so much from them about their family history. So it got me interested enough to start taking classes about the Japanese American experience. And that's actually in the American Studies Department. That's why today's program is called Celebrating the American Experience. The Japanese American Experience is part of the American story. And so what I learned were several things that truly inspire me. Number one, it's their spirit of gaman enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. We saw that after the 311. People weren't running all over in panic, you know, looting and, 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 and doing other, you know, bad deeds. There's hard work, gambare. And there's also determination to build a better life for their children, kodomo no tameni. The first record of Japanese coming to America dates back to 1869, going to California, and in Hawaii, about 1885. These were all contract workers. They built railroad, they work on plantations, whether it's sugar plantation in Hawaii or sugar beet plantations in Idaho and Oregon. As time goes by, their hard-earned money meant they could start small businesses, buy farms, to start their own independent farming, even if this means getting land that are so poor or so difficult that white farmers did not care for. But slowly, their hard work paid off. A new generation of Japanese Americans were born in this country, the Nisei, the second generation. Communities grew. There were shops, schools, churches, and baseball teams. Not that life wasn't difficult. Racial discrimination kept the Issei, the first generation, from becoming citizens. The law barred them from becoming citizens. And of course, we know that contrasts sharply with what we know about the story for other Americans that came through, uh, what is this, uh, in New York, was that? Ellis Island, right? And the Nisei, too, at best only find themselves a second-class citizen. Then December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The next day, President Roosevelt declared, it was a day that will live in infamy. Two months later, barely, on February 19, 1942, Executive Order 9066 was issued. It declared that all persons of Japanese ancestry excluded from the entire West Coast. At that time, there was about 127,000 Japanese Americans in the entire continental US, the other group in Hawaii. And nearly 90% of this 127,000 were right there in the West Coast. Nearly all were forced to leave their homes in a moment's notice, picked up by military vehicles at their door, and to be told to take nothing more than one suitcase. The U.S. Census Bureau helped the FBI to round up these people by giving them confidential personal information, 
about where they are located. The forced location, relocation and incarceration of these Japanese Americans in internment camps in seven states was an atrocious violation of their rights as citizens and as humans. Two-thirds of all these who were round up were natural-born U.S. citizens. They were housed in tar paper barracks, constructed in a great hurry. There were guards on guard towers watching them with guns pointed at them, ready to shoot anyone who dared to move without permission. Some challenged this incarceration and sued the government, but the Supreme Court in 1944 upheld the constitutionality of their removal under Executive Order 9066. When this Supreme Court ruling was made, bear in mind, thousands of Japanese Americans made the difficult decision to accept the offer from the U.S. government to serve in two segregated units, the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. It was a difficult choice. Imagine, if you would, would you serve a country that denies your citizenship? Would you serve a country that locks you up, locks up your family in an internment camp, and with no certainty if you will ever regain freedom? And possibly, you already have lost everything you work for and believe in about this country. For those who decided to take up the offer, they proved themselves to be the most courageous soldiers America has ever seen. The 100th Infantry Battalion was made up largely of Nisei, the second generation who were former members of the Hawaii Army National Guard. This was the only combat arms unit in the U.S. Army Reserve. Over the course of the war, it came to be known as the Purple Heart Battalion. It speaks to the fact that this is a nickname that's earned through their many battles and casualties. The 442nd, in which the late senator served, had the motto, go for broke, nothing to lose. The 442 became the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the history of American warfare, and that record still stands. About 14,000 in total served in the unit, earning 9,486 Purple Hearts, awarded nine, I'm sorry, eight presidential unit citations, and 21 members received Medal of Honor. One of the bloodiest battles for the 442 was in the mountains of France, close to Germany. It was to rescue the lost battalion. The 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry, made up of members of the Texas National Guard. They were trapped for days behind German lines. The 442 was already exhausted from other battles when it was sent to rescue the lost battalion. And this was to be the final attempt to rescue these Texas men. In five days of fighting in the cold, wet, muddy hills from October 26th to October 30th, 1944, 211 Texas men were rescued, while for the 442, 200 men were killed or lost in action, another 800 seriously injured. This was courage under fire. The accomplishment of the 100th and the 442 helped persuade Roosevelt to rescind the Executive Order 9066 on December 17, 1944. It allowed the Japanese Americans to return to the West Coast, but mind you, the government never found a single case of treason against any Japanese American. And despite showing their loyalty and courage, the Japanese Americans pretty much lost all they had worked hard to build over years and decades. Their homes, lands, businesses left in disrepair because they were gone or worse, stolen from them. But gaman, they did, bearing the unbearable and persevere. Because it was kodomo no tameni, it was for the sake of the children. They started all over again, and many of the men who served took advantage of the GI Bill, just like the late senator, went to school, pursued careers in politics, in business, in many spheres of American life. And it was this war experience that really transformed what it means for them to be Japanese Americans. The Nisei generation in particular refused to be second-class citizens anymore. Many stood up and got involved in politics, from running for elected offices to being active members in civil rights movement. I just found out, too, that one of the co-founders of the Black Panther movement is actually a Japanese-American. 
And they, they've not stopped. You know, Japanese Americans, whether they're newcomers, continuing first generation, or second, third, fourth generations by now, continue to make important contributions to make a better America, a more perfect union. Knowing full well how public hysteria can undermine individual rights and liberties, <clears throat> Japanese Americans were among the first to speak up after 9-11 to defend Muslims and other targeted communities against paranoia and extreme national security measures. And I know Irene was one of those voices who spoke up immediately after those days. Of course, in so many spheres of life, we find Japanese Americans making contributions to name just a few names. For instance, the New York Times literary critic, Michiko Kakutani, Ted Fujita, who created the Fujita scale, very relevant to us, because it's a scale for rating tornado intensity. <laughs> We also have Eric Shinsuke, uh, Shinsuke. He was a U.S. Army Chief of Staff from 1999 to 2003, and today a Japanese American woman is the Assistant Secretary for the Army Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Patsy Mink, Congresswoman from Hawaii, co-authored the Title IX Amendment to make sure there's equality in education for women. She was also the first Asian American to serve in Congress. Of course, there is the late senator. At one point, he was president pro tempore of the US Senate, making him third in line of presidential succession. So at one point, we have two Hawaii boys right up there. <laughs> he was the highest ranking Asian American politician in US history and the first Japanese American to serve in the US House of Representatives and later in the US Senate. And of course, as a member of the 442, he was a recipient of the Medal of Honor and he was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor as well. And one more I discovered too was even the creator of Scooby-Doo is Japanese American. <laughs> so Irene is really part of this generation of Japanese Americans who consciously, devotedly work to make America a better place. All her life, she has worked in capacities to improve American society, expanding the American experience. A full list of her institutional affiliations and achievements can run to a couple dozen pages at least. I'm sorry. And most prominent, though, is her leadership of three organizations. First, it was the THE Clinic for Women in Los Angeles from 1975 to 1988, for which Irene served as the executive director. The clinic provides medical counseling and education services. As executive director, she's responsible for fiscal, personnel, fundraising, communi community relations, basically everything. From there, she took her knowledge, skills, and experience to even a bigger challenge, creating a brand new museum and running it. Irene was president and CEO of the Japanese American National Museum from 1988 to 2008, raising $80 million to construct the buildings, acquire the collections, fund research, and build endowment. It was an amazing place to learn about Japanese American history. I really encourage everyone to go visit it if you're in, 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 in Los Angeles. And go to the side too and you see a memorial for the 100th and the 442. In fact, for the 100th, I was just remarking to Irene, it's so touching for me to see, they actually say it, it's one puka puka. Puka means zero, whole in Hawaiian pidgin. <laughs> so Irene, by this point, could have retired and go travel, write a book, you know, kick back, relax. Or at best, only contribute some time to boards, as she does on so many of them, including the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History, Toyota's North American uh, Diversity Board, the Ford Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, just goes on and on. But no, not for Irene. She founded a brand new organization in 2009. She leveraged all her knowledge, experience, and networks to create the U.S.-Japan Council. It's a nonprofit educational institution based in D.C., and this time she's going beyond the shores of America. As president, she's leading the U.S.-Japan Council in its mission to foster an international network of Japanese American leaders to work with their peers in the US, in Japan, to ensure strong US-Japan relations. Amongst its many programs is the uh, Tomodachi Initiative. It's a public 
private partnership that grew out of the 311 disaster in Japan. The goal is to foster a new generation of U.S.-Japan friendships, tomodachi, friends. There are education and cultural exchanges as well as leadership activities. And the Tomodachi initiative, in my view, is especially meaningful to us in Dallas because of our sister relationship with San Sendai, which was most severely affected by 311 uh, incidents. So this year in August, another group of young Japanese high school students will be coming to Dallas for a week-long exchange under this Tomodachi initiative. The Japan, the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth is a partner in this effort, and it does a tremendous job, and I can speak from experience because we were host to one of these students back in 2013, so I hope everyone will support this very meaningful activity. And now with Irene's visit to Dallas and her acceptance of an honorary degree from SMU, I think I speak for all of us that we hope you and the U.S.-Japan Council will continue to work with us in Dallas to expand our shared interest in promoting U.S.-Japan relations and deepening understanding and friendship between Japan, uh, between the Japanese and Texans, I mean, Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I've been living here for about almost three years now, so it's Texas. <laughs> but I still love Hawaii, so. So welcome, Irene, and thank you for your contributions to the American experience and to U.S.-Japan relations. Thank you. Um, next spe uh, speaker is Admiral and Dr. Patrick Walsh. <laughs> uh, my colleagues, uh, Hiroki and Annie, have really set the stage, I think, for uh, a very interesting afternoon, and we'll be very, very uh, interested in your reaction to remarks and the questions that you have to follow. It's a real uh, pleasure, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today and offer my personal views on the future of the U.S.-Japan relationship. I come at this subject from, from operational experience in the security sphere, so I offer my opinions and my insights really based on uh, many years of military operations with the Japanese Self-Defense Force. I've done that in the maritime domain as well as in the air and on the ground and have been witness to very close working bilateral relationships and arrangements so that uh, when we work together, we work together in substantive ways at command level, uh, tabletop exercises ashore, operations at sea, uh, we'll present white papers together with Japanese colleagues when we have strategic sessions hosted by think tanks. Uh, we've hosted uh, high-level talks between military counterparts involving ambassadors as well as senior government leaders. And we'll do this in headquarters. We'll do it in offices. We've done it in our personal residences. Additionally, I am uh, especially grateful to be here today with Irene uh, to recognize her passion and her life's work as well as the tremendous goodwill that you've helped to establish between the people of Japan and the people of the United States. I'm especially honored as well to speak about a very special working relationship that Pacific Fleet commanders had and enjoyed with the late Senator Inouye. He was wise, he was experienced, he was thoughtful, he was deliberative, and those who enjoyed the pleasure of his company appreciated it and they valued his counsel, they valued his advice, his coaching, and his mentoring. He offered that often, often at a uh, sacrifice to his own personal schedule as well as to his office schedule and the personal time that he had available to himself. Each session with the senator was interesting and it was informative. And each time we left his office, we remembered. We remembered the time with him, and we remembered the feeling that he gave us. It was a feeling that gave us a sense of renewed commitment and enthusiasm for the important work that we were doing representing the national interests of the United States on the world stage in Asia Pacific. We had knowledge and confidence that we had a friend in Washington that was always available to listen, always available to help, and always available to support our mission as well as the men and women who wore the uniform, who represented him. And those men and women represent all that we value and all that we stand for. 
So my operational experience at the command level begins with a rim of the Pacific exercise. Uh, this is one of the largest military exercises uh, held in the world. It's uh, held out of Hawaii every two years. It involves more than 22,000 people in more than 14 countries participate. The Japanese Self-Defense Force are our colleagues in command. And so we work in a very close bilateral command and control relationship with the Japanese. And where I'm taking you with this discussion is that the relationship that we have at the military to military level is very mature, it's very operationally oriented, it's very experienced. From my time in the rim of the Pacific exercise, I worked with uh, my Japanese colleagues another time when I went on to command naval forces in the Middle East. Japan had a program that the Diet had approved for many years after 9-11 that involved the use of Japanese oil that could be used for coalition forces that were prosecuting uh, what was then known as the global war on terror. Uh, that oil was for free and it was for use of coalition ships. Because that oil was available, it allowed countries such as Pakistan to participate in the coalition effort. Because Pakistan could participate, Pakistan could lead that coalition. When Pakistan could lead the coalition, then that in itself was more than just a symbolic act. It attracted countries from all the GCC nations to participate in something that was much larger than I think the people of Japan ever envisioned or realized. And sadly, these stories never do get back, um, these stories of appreciation or recognition never do get adequately represented back to the people who support it, the people who fund it. And every opportunity I have to speak in public, I, I draw this out because this was critically important to understanding now the, the work that we were doing and the challenge that we faced. This is a world that individual actors have strategic impact. We saw that with 9-11, and we saw the impact that just 19 people could have uh, in the United States and on the world and the world economy. Japan took a leading role early on in this discussion to help us understand how to evaluate pattern of life analysis and how to conduct operations in a way that were precise, and they enabled us uh, to be effective in an environment that was very daunting just by the sheer, uh, sheer size and scope of both the mission as well as the geography. I took the lessons learned from my interactions with the Self-Defense Force uh, to Washington as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations and then back out to the Pacific where I had command of the Pacific Fleet. When I was in command of the Pacific Fleet, one of the biggest challenges that we had in the 2009 to 2012 period was trying to describe both urgency and speed in which events were changing in the Pacific. The tectonic plates, more than just the physical plates, but the, the plates that held together peoples and the organizing principles in the Pacific were under challenge by the rise of China. And trying to convince to uh, an audience that was uh, several time zones away, the urgency and the speed with which we were seeing that change was very, very hard to convey. The net result is that individual events that could take place at a very local level uh, that ought to have been resolved at a local level could not be resolved at a local level and were escalated to the point where uh, those who wanted to challenge the individual sovereignty of countries, such as uh, Chinese trawlers that wanted to intrude into Japanese economic exclusion zones um, without authority to fish, um, were, were playing bumper cars in the South China Sea and it ended up resulting in uh, detained personnel and the escalation of tension to the point where there were threats of an, uh, an embargo on rare earth metals. So uh, quickly, events that should have been localized were escalated to the point where uh, we had the real threat of tension now at the national level. So where we are today, I think, is uh, an inflection point in history that challenges the, the foundational structure of old alliances with new challenges and in new ways. These challenges have, have really brought a rules-based framework for setting aside nationalistic charge differences and disputes and age-old conflicts, uh, which were in favor of stability, economic pros uh, progress, and with it, prosperity. 
that has positively influenced the wealth and health of all democratically minded countries in the region. All of that now is at risk. And the challenge that we face today, if I could put it in one word, is rejection. Rejection of the order that brought us that economic wealth and prosperity. A rejection of the rules-based system for the peaceful resolution of disputes, arbitration, international law, and the order that it has created to benefit so many for 70 years. Tension plays out today in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea. It's played out today in the economic exclusion zones. It's played out with the establishment of an air defense identification zone with border disputes, uh, even on the India-China border. The challenge we face today, the challenge that we faced with our colleagues today in Japan, is one that threatens to undermine all the progress that's been made to date. Progress that's helped to define national integrity and wholeness, which is so critically important to sovereign passions and national interests. Equally important to the trend lines that we see and observe as military imbalances are created in the air, in the maritime domain, and on the ground, it gives China a sense and a means to seize disputed territory or in the case of the South China Sea, to create territory through reclamation operations at sea. We are also witness in the cyber domain, where potential adversaries and competitors seek informational advantage on Japan in ongoing disputes, in advantage in economic competition with Japan, and in planning advantage for future military engagements with Japan. Through the use of cyber espionage, these adversaries seek valuable information from Japan with limited risk to themselves and limited cost to themselves. And they're driven in the cyber domain against Japan because of disputed claims. Uh, they're also very interested in Japan's military transformation, and they're interested in Asia geopolitical dynamics as well as Japan's industrial preeminence. So what this means for the future in an area where China seeks to change the game, change the rules-based system through influence over key global institutions where it will strive to reduce the U.S. role in the Pacific and attempt to change the regional order to its favor. If ever there was a time and place where the work that Irene has done and what she represents is important to us and that is valuable to the alliance of the future, it is now. There are challenges to, the, to international law. There are challenges to freedom of navigation. There are challenges to peace and security. And I think if ever there was a time for Tomodachi, Tomodachi next, it is a time where we must stand together. There's been too much history and treasure lost in this part of the world, and yet too much prosperity that is possible and too much potential that has yet to be realized and the last thing we should do is to sit back and quietly just let it go. We owe it to those who have been before us, who have brought us a better world today, to stand together as friends. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Ms. Irene Hirano Inoue to the stage. Um, we have another Hawaiian <laughs> another Hawaiian element to this program. So she's already got one lay, but we're going to give her a second one here. So let's give her a hand and welcome her to the stage. So I should say aloha. <laughs> aloha. What we're supposed to say is aloha. <laughs> I feel very much at home, and so th thank you for the lays. One was from um, Annie. And uh, first, let me say how great it is to be here in uh, Dallas, and I'm truly on honored to um, be receiving a, a degree tomorrow from um, SMU. You might wonder how that uh, connection came about. And uh, so some of you may know the former dean of SMU, Bill Atsui, who uh, I got to know in 2011. Uh, he was part of a, a Japanese-American leadership delegation, and I take each year a group of Japanese-American leaders from around the country. So Bill and I were in Japan uh, on March 11, uh, 2011, when the earthquake struck. 
And um, so for both of us and for those that were on the delegation, it was a very um, meaningful time to be there. And certainly I have really appreciated the chance to continue to work on um, being able to support the re region, and I'll talk about that in just a few moments. So Bill was the one that made the recommendation for me to receive um, the to receive the a degree. And as you know, Bill, um, uh, ten months ago, became the president of Hendricks College, uh, just outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, in a place called Conway. And uh, uh, about a month ago, I had the chance to go and uh, see Bill become um, become um, inaugurated as the president. And it was really wonderful to be um, in Conway and to be in Little Rock. And as Annie was sharing the w wonderful um, history, um, in the Arkansas area, there were two uh, camps, a Jerome and, and another camp called Rower that was in the Arkansas area. And my uh, grandfather on my father's side was in the rower camp. And so it was, uh, I think, a special time for me to be back in Arkansas. And as you heard, I spent um, many years working with a group of, of really wonderful individuals to build the uh, Japanese American National uh, Museum. And my, and my late husband used to talk about Arkansas and about the rower camps, and I thought I'd just share that story with you briefly uh, because it reminded me of how he used to talk about this. And so when the 442 were training at Camp Shelby, uh, Mississippi, um, the uh, boys from uh, Hawaii and the, and the uh, mainland uh, boys, as they would call themselves, did not get along. They came from various cultures, they would fight all the time, and there was a point at which they were actually going to um, disband the 442. And so one of the uh, commanders um, came up with the idea to send a group of the uh, young men to Aurora, Arkansas. So they didn't know exactly where they were going, but that they were going to have a good time. And it turned out that they were all from uh, Hawaii, that that was the group that they sent. And so the senator talked about how they went from Camp Shelby, uh, Mississippi, to Aurora, Arkansas. And as they approached the campsite, they realized that it was uh, surrounded by barbed wire and that there were uh, men in a machine gun tower uh, uh, that, were, that had guns pointed in, not out. And so it became very clear to them that many of the men that they were training with at Camp Shelby, their families were in places like a rower. So when the Ahoy boys went back to Camp Shelby, they um, immediately then gelled, and that was how the 442 became um, so close and went on, of course, to, uh, to the many uh, contributions that they made to the war that Annie talked about. So it was really quite um, a point of, of, of both uh, connections and reconnections when I had the chance to be in uh, Little Rock uh, and to see Bill Atsui as part of his um, inauguration. And it reminds me of the ways in which our stories uh, connect, uh, how they are important to remember, and that was a good part of the work that um, I had a chance to do. And uh, being here uh, in, in this part of the uh, country reminds me also, and there's some good friends that are here, the, the uh, person who was a member of the board of the uh, trustees for the uh, museum was from Fort Worth, Texas, um, Elaine Yamagata, and her son and her, and, and her, and her um, daughter-in-law are here, Harvey and Mary. And Elaine and her husband, Tad, were early trustees of the uh, museum. And they, uh, she would come out from, uh, from uh, Fort Worth and contribute to the building of the institution. And so being back here reminds me of her and, and of their family. And so it is great to be here. And having spent that time working on the uh, museum was really, for me, uh, an opportunity to hear so many important stories, stories that weren't told, as Annie said, for m many, many years, stories about World War II, stories about the first uh, generation and the hardships that they faced that allowed those like myself and uh, others to really have every um, opportunity as we um, began to um, build our own, own lives. And so I, I over oh, the 20 years that I had a chance to work with the institution, was ev every day really uh, gratified for the hardships that the first uh, generation, and then those like um, my uh, father's uh, generation, he was part of the military intelligence service, 
that also, also served in World War II, what they, um, what they were able to do, not only during the course of the war years, but when they came back, and as Annie said, really um, started over, over again, rebuilt their lives, and made opportunities for all of us. And my work with the U.S.-Japan Council, which, um, as you heard, began in uh, the late 2008, early 2009, was an opportunity to bring together many people who were concerned about, at that time, it was um, a, more of a description about Japan passing, and I think there was a sense that there were other countries in Asia that were important in terms of the U.S.-Asia uh, US relationship. And many of us felt that that was not the case, should not be, be the case. And the U.S.-Japan Council was formed to quite simply create a strong people-to-people uh, -people relationship at the business level, the government level, and the civil society level. And through bringing together leaders from across the country and in Japan, felt that it was an um, important foundation to continue to build upon the many years of friendship that our two countries have had since the end of World War II. Um, so as um, Pat uh, re uh, had talked about with the earthquake and a tsunami on March the 11th, and of course I was there, um, I went back in May of 2011 with the senator, and we uh, had a chance to tour the area that was devastated by the uh, disasters. And we uh, took a um, helicopter and toured the region and then went on the ground and talked to the members of um, uh, the U.S. Armed Forces as well as the uh, Japan Self-Defense Forces. And what they kept saying over and over again was that the reason that they were able to be so effective was because they had worked together, had trained, had trained together, and knew each other, and that that really enabled them to so quickly be able to mobilize and to be so effective. And I think that that uh, work together that people in Japan and people around the world saw um, really was an important kind of next step of people in both countries understanding the uh, significance of our friendship and the importance from a, certainly from a, from a, a security standpoint, but from an um, economic stand, standpoint. So as a follow-on to Operation Tomodachi, uh, the U.S.-Japan Council was asked by our then Ambassador John Roos to um, create an initiative that would uh, support the, uh, the uh, recovery of the uh, Tohoku region and also, also contribute to the longer-term building of a strong people-to-people uh, -people friendship. And that's how the initiative um, came about. It's been four years now, and we weren't sure when we first started to uh, raise funds whether how, how long that there would be interest in supporting um, the uh, recovery. And um, we made the decision that we would focus on young people, that the investment in the next generation uh, to ensure that our, that our, our relationship uh, was strong for years to come uh, would be an important way that we could, con that we could contribute to the uh, recovery but the long-term needs. And we decided to um, encourage young people to um, uh, come to the United States from uh, Japan. The first uh, group of students that we, uh, that we were able to support was from the region that was affected by the uh, disasters. So over the four-year period now, we've uh, been able to serve over 10,000 young people. The majority of them have been from the uh, Tohoku region. We've had over 3,000 that have been involved in exchange programs, so young uh, Japanese that have come to the United States on uh, short-term uh, exchanges, on fellowships, on scholarships. We have programs that are focusing on leadership development for young uh, professionals. And we've also been able to bring young Americans um, to, uh, to also travel to uh, Japan. And so as you heard, we've been fortunate to partner with the with with the uh, Japan America Society, and, the, and I've known a Anna for many years through my work with the uh, museum prior. Um, but they've been a wonderful partner. We um, have programs that we are doing in Houston, and so I'm, I'm grateful that the Council General is here. He'll be hosting a, a program for um, a young uh, professionals that the uh, Mitsui uh, Corporation has been uh, supporting and will be doing the uh, orientation in uh, Houston in a couple of weeks. 
Uh, and so there's just been a marvelous opportunity to plant the seeds that I, I do believe are going to be very important. I think as Pat said that the building of the relationship through the friendships that we make and through being able to, to know each other. Uh, I think certainly that the state of Texas and this region in particular is going to play a critical role in the future. There's a lot of Japanese investments that are, um, that are finding their way here, many companies here that are investing in um, Japan, and that along with those investments also, also needs to come a very strong foundation of people that know each other and work together. And uh, so I think through programs that we support but that are are also uh, being uh, supported and organized through uh, groups like the um, like the uh, Japan American Societies that I'm uh, very hopeful about the future. As you heard, the Prime Minister's visit to the United States occurred uh, very recently, and I think it was quite. Um, in, uh, quite important that he not only went to Washington and to Boston, but he went out to California. Hopefully, at a future visit, he'll come to Texas and to places in the Midwest. Um, but I, I think that um, uh, the message of the significance of relationships that need to be built throughout the U.S. and throughout uh, Japan, we've been working uh, for the past few years to bring um, a number of governors from uh, Japan to the U U.S., and certainly there have been a lot of governors that have gone to uh, Japan. So I think at every level that we um, need to invest and that we need to strengthen. And I was uh, especially encouraged that in the joint statements that followed um, the prime minister's visit with uh, the president, that one of the key aspects beyond uh, security and the um, economy was uh, the uh, commitment by both countries to invest in our people-to-people uh, -people relationships at all levels and at the academic level uh, as well as at the grassroots level. So it is really uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here. It's a chance for me to see uh, longtime friends and I've made a lot of great friends already just in the short time that I've been here and I do hope uh, to continue to come back and find ways for us to work together and to ensure that there is a very strong uh, relationship between our two countries. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before moving to uh, discussion, I'd like to um, thank uh, Tower Center staff members, uh, which makes this event possible. Um, uh, Luisa de Rosal, who uh, did everything, uh, and then uh, she had to leave. Uh, so, and um, Ji Yun Pyun, um, who did everything until yesterday, and then uh, now she is um, at home um, um, waiting for having a baby. Um, and then um, uh, Ray Lafidi uh, over there uh, and uh, uh, Cindy Thompson. Uh, so please uh, uh, join me for acknowledging them. Okay, so uh, I would like to um, open uh, to the floor uh, for discussion. So um, who wants to um, start? Um, yes. Thank you so much for the very interesting presentation. My question goes actually, what happened to the properties of the Japanese Americans which were interned? Was it confiscated, were they reimbursed, or what happened there? You must correct me if I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of them basically really just lost it all. I mean, there were those who I learned were lucky enough to have good friends, put it bluntly, white friends and white neighbors that they could even in token sell their property to so that they come back and were able to reclaim some of these things and that these properties were then looked after while they for years were locked up. For the majority, it was just gone. And that's why many of them, though they were given the freedom to return to the West Coast, then also began new lives elsewhere. So it kind of helped in that very tragic process, a kind of movement of Japanese Americans beyond the West Coast. The official apology to the Japanese Americans finally came about only during the Reagan administration. 
following a commission that was brought together by President Carter to examine what was done and the injustice. And in that process, each living individual at the time was offered 20,000 US dollars. But for the Japanese American community, as you can appreciate in any community in such discussions, there may be different viewpoints, but I think the overwhelming sense was it was the apology. It was the apology, acknowledgement that something was done wrong to them. And as a result of that process too, US law was amended creating the Civil Liberties Act so that the liberties and rights of Americans should never be violated again in the same manner. No, I think that was a great answer, Annie. Oh, I just remember something. She was saying the difference between the Hawaii boys and the <laughs> mainland boys. I remember the names that they had for each other. The Hawaii boys were known as Buddha heads, right? <laughs> they're so Japanese, they're Buddha heads. Whereas the mainland boys were Kotonk. The Hawaii boys call them Kotonk because they said their heads, they're kind of like white on the outside, uh, you know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside kind of meaning. But it also means like their heads is like coconut coming down, <laughs> Kotonk. <laughs> so it took a while for these Buddha heads and Kotonks to truly gel, and gel they did. Um, yes, there is a hand. It's, yeah. I would also add that the Canadian government, I had a client who was honorary counsel from Japan in Dallas, and he was awarded $20,000 from the Canadian government as well. Yes. That, there was internment in Canada as well. Uh, this question kind of goes to Admiral Walsh as a former Navy aviator, commander of SYNCPAC. I know that Josh would be interested in hearing the answer also since he was a former strategist for the Naval War College. What is your impression of the reclamation project by the Japanese in the Spratly Islands? Chinese, so excuse me. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a flagrant violation of international law. When I had an opportunity to uh, finally meet my Chinese counterpart, Admiral Wu Sheng Li, um, after two and a half years or so of trying to get on his schedule. We had a very uh, clear, direct conversation on, on the Chinese view of the South China Sea. Um, I asked him, is, uh, is it accurate that the Chinese media are reporting the South China Sea as a core interest? And he said, yes. Core interest is language that's reserved for um, specific geographic areas that threaten or undermine the stability of the regime. And that's characterized by uh, Tibet and Taiwan. So now, meaning 2010 timeframe, um, the Chinese media were reporting that the South China Sea was a core interest. I asked him then if it's a core interest, is this based on, on a historic interest? Is it based on a sovereign interest? Is it based on a tribute system, meaning falling back into Chinese history where there were certain actions that visitors were supposed to take when entering the domain of a Chinese person or home? Um, and, and the answer was uh, no answer. The answer was, we claim the South China Sea. It is indisputable, so therefore, there is no dispute. So when you, when you look at the reclamation effort that's underway now, uh, this is a clever interpretation of the law of the sea. So China has signed on to the law of the sea treaty. And if you look at the provisions inside um, the convention, what it describes are delimitation rules, meaning uh, economic exclusion zones, so by extrapolation, that apply to habitable areas. So even though there are 6,000 rocks, reefs, and shoals inside the South China Sea, those were not habitable and therefore did not subscribe to the rules that would uh, offer them 
uh, sovereign rights attendant to it, meaning mining, fishing, all of that. So the, the, the context, I think, with it, that is the run-up to what we see manifested today that really challenges the international order, the taxonomy, the language, the definition of terms that we've come to understand and that has yielded prosperity and progress in ways, is that we are looking at economic development and populations that continue to grow healthier, which now put greater and greater demand on resources. And the resource demand is playing out at sea and it's manifest in the Spratleys, the Paracel, uh, all the islands that are in the region. And the effort to, to reclaim that now is to make it habitable so that by definition, they will be able to exercise sovereign rights attendant to it. This is one way to use an interpretation of law to national advantage. Uh, my critique of the U.S. position on this uh, before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is that we need to ascribe to the Law of the Sea Convention. We helped write it. We can't seem to get it to the floor for a vote. Well, uh, I just may add, so we, we've been very fortunate um, to have great uh, commanders in the uh, Pacific, and certainly Pat was um, really uh, uh, did an outstanding job during his time as the uh, as the as the head of the uh, Pacific Fleet. Um, our current commander, the Pacific Fleet, Harry Hill, is a, a Japanese American. People might not know that, but his mother is um, is is uh, from uh, Japan, and he will be there'll be a change of command soon, but he will become the uh, Pacific uh, commander. So I think Annie, to your list, you can add him yeah. to <laughs> those that have achieved uh, really um, uh, really um, amazing positions. Uh, one thing that I would add is uh, uh, a chilling fact is uh, uh, there is no U.S. military presence between Okinawa and Singapore. And it's very difficult for uh, the U.S. Um, uh, presence to um, cover uh, the South China Sea um, right now. Well, the U.S. is talking about, uh, about it uh, with uh, uh, the Philippines and Vietnam now, but that's the current uh, reality is there is no military presence of the United States uh, between Okinawa and Singapore. Um, and that's such a very long distance, by the way. Um, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so thank you very much, SMU, for this uh, wonderful arrangement. It's really meaningful, and I really appreciate the panel for uh, uh, very good discussions, and uh, uh, I would uh, very much like to thank everybody. Uh, it was so impressive, I mean, the, today's discussion, because it uh, so much has a relevance to what is happening between Japan and the United States. Uh, it has touched upon two major themes of uh, 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 Prime Minister's visit, and a summit meeting with President Obama. And uh, one is that you know, the, uh, the Honorable Irene Hirano uh, talked about the importance of exchange and goodwill. And uh, also you know, the uh, Admiral Walsh talked about you know, the uh, uh, great assistance the United States had ever offered, uh, incredible assistance after this 311. And uh, uh, that has laid the foundation for a stronger military alliance between Japan and the United States. And uh, a new guidelines set up for a uh, uh, larger Japan's role to participate in the uh, maintenance of peace and stability in the uh, in a global sense, and especially in this uh, uh, Asian region. Uh, use of, uh, uh, re I mean, the uh, interpretation of uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, constitution has been modified so that uh, it allows uh, use uh, resort to uh, collective self-defense. So it's a, a big thing. And uh, uh, another thing was that, you know, the uh, uh, 70 years after the war, and uh, uh, I, th I think Japanese American are so uh, kind, but uh, uh, what was uh, reality uh, 70 years before, or even 75, was that uh, without Pearl Harbor, of course, in consideration didn't happen. Uh, but the uh, uh, Prime Minister has uh, expressed uh, when he visited Arlington National Cemetery, uh, his deep repentance, repentance for the uh, uh, lost American souls, and also the uh, uh, feeling of deep remorse over the war. And he said also uh, in the uh, Congress that uh, uh, Japan should not avert its eyes from the suffering uh, Japan has caused to uh, peoples in Asia. 
So all these have the relevance. And uh, uh, what has happened 70 years before and 75, uh, and uh, uh, great efforts on both sides. Uh, because you know the, at the Congress, uh, there was uh, uh, Major Snowden, and also the uh, uh, Congressman Shindo, of who is a uh, uh, grandson of uh, Major Kurihara, uh, both fought in the Iwo Jima, but uh, they uh, shook hands in the Congress. So uh, this kind of uh, thing is really uh, great. And uh, uh, my question was uh, to the uh, Honorable Irene Hirano, was that you know the, uh, uh, there must have been this great, uh, I don't know how to say, before coming to a reconciliation with the past, of course, you know, the uh, uh, President Reagan helped so much, uh, but uh, I think there has been a very difficult period of, of uh, uh, being uh, American citizen and at the same time having a Japanese ancestry. So how did you reconcile? I, when I uh, uh, when we first started to build the uh, the uh, Japanese American National uh, Museum, um, people were reluctant to talk about their stories, and it was that period leading up to the eventual passage of the Civil Liberties Act that Annie talked about uh, in 1988 that people finally began to um, talk about. Um, the, their loss uh, uh, as uh, the war broke out and and um, the uh, uh, the fact that they had to live behind barbed wire and so forth and and the period even after uh, uh, the war when people began to resettle and the hardships that they faced in rebuilding their their lives um, but I think you know one of the uh, the uh, remarkable parts of the story is that people um, uh, were not bitter. Uh, there were those certainly who, you know, who um, continued to have very um, bad feelings. But I think for the most part that the Japanese Americans um, rebuilt their lives. They came back and they were determined to ensure that their that their that their um, that their families had every opportunity. So. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from that, and um, a lot of the Nisei soldiers talked a lot about um, the fact that they did not want to uh, to um, bring shame on their families, uh, and that spirit, I think, that is very much a part of the uh, Japanese culture and the upbringing, um, I think helped to uh, enable people to endure that period, and it was always with the view of looking ahead for what the they'd be able to do for their families. I, I know that um, NHK last night, or the night before, ran uh, a special program about the 442nd and their, um, uh, what they had to go through. And I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I've been getting e emails over the course of the last day about how moving it was, and for a lot of the Japanese and a lot of Americans that don't know that story. So I think that'll be re-shown re on um, um, uh, uh, the NHK world here. Um, but I, I think that having the opportunity to share those stories and part of the, I think, the impact that the uh, museum had was a way to talk about the, a collective experience and that it wasn't just something... A lot of people, I think, felt that somehow they were at fault that they did something, and I think as as the second generation, many of them were young. They were um, young, they were young uh, children or t teenagers. That um, that sense of guilt uh, and that sense of shame, and so f for the the passage of the redress bill was significant for in many ways. One because it was the first time that that the U.S. or any country would um, apologize to its people, and two, I think for the Japanese Americans, the sense that. Um, they were not at fault and that they were not wrong and that the a determination to ensure that we should always strive to uphold our civil liberties so that it does not happen to other people again has been an important driving force as a result of what occurred. Jim, um, question for uh, Dr. Wong. Now, from your opening, you mentioned the internment camps. And, uh, of course, that was obviously very harsh on a number of people. At the same time, those of us who lived during World War II uh, can recall there were a lot of other tragedies and harshness. And we didn't have communications then as we do today. 
the political environment was certainly not the same then as it probably would have been today. That would never have happened. But we came to win that war. I'm just wondering it either shortly after the packing of the one bag each, was there any attempt to try to explain you just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Was that ever uh, attempted to be made known? It's an interesting question. Again. That's a very interesting question. I am not aware that there was, I mean, there was explanation to the extent that there's a declaration, here's a statement from the government saying you have to do this, and then next thing you know is get on the truck. Um, there were, I have to mention, also small, small number of Italian Americans and German Americans who were interned during the war, but the treatment of the Japanese was en masse, clearly racially driven, and that was acknowledged in the official apology offered in 1988, right? Yeah. So I think that really sets it apart. And as I mentioned, through all those years, not a single case of disloyalty perpetrated by any Japanese American was ever found. Jim. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Pat Walsh if he could tell us uh, some of the things you did in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. What, what role the U.S. Navy played uh, in helping uh, uh, bring relief to the Japanese people? We know because Japan is the most instrumented country in the world, uh, the epicenter of where this took place. About 65 miles off the coast, at a depth of about 21,500 feet, uh, the Pacific Plate and the Eurasian Plate pushing up against each other for about 300 years, uh, releases all that energy. It releases a wave that's uh, traveling at about 500 miles per hour, uh, heading both towards Japan as well as towards Hawaii. And the initial reaction that we had was to start moving ships and people away from the beaches in Hawaii. It was uh, late at night when it occurred, and it was uh, something that uh, uh, for commanders who were in the region, uh, all of us were watching uh, the, the uh, reports on the seismograph in terms of what instrumentation was telling us. We know that anything over 8.3 is a thousand year event in Japan. Um, as the reports came in, we thought there was problem with instrumentation uh, because as it reached 9.1, we realized we had something that was catastrophic. So ship commanders on their own got their, their crews back to ship and got underway in ports such as Singapore and started heading back towards um, the uh, territorial waters of Japan to stay outside the 12 mile limit until invited in. Um, the initial reaction when watching this uh, take place was that uh, as, the, as the wave hit, remember this is at 21,500 feet, this is about uh, 10 billion tons of water that's looking for a place to go. And it goes six and a half miles inland, it funnels up to about 133 feet, depending on the topography. And what no one anticipated was that the size of the earthquake would affect the tilt of the Earth's axis that uh, it would move Japan seven feet and that uh, the coastline would actually drop. So for those who were in Tokyo at the time, the buildings and the architecture and the design actually held up and held up well. Uh, but what no one anticipated was the coastline dropping by more than a meter and the impact it would have on a tsunami wave as it, as it was coming towards the beach. Um, when Fukushima lost primary, secondary, and tertiary power, um, we, we then saw um, uh, a meltdown here inside of uh, plant one, two, and three. Uh, uh, five and six were offline, and uh, the concern was not only the hydrogen explosion that took place that blew off the roof, but also now uh, a reaction that was taking place in a way that was going to be very, very difficult to control. Uh, we had no experience with anything like this. In addition to that, each building had uh, spent fuel rods in containers uh, 
outside the building next to it that required circulation in order for that spent fuel to continue to cool down uh, for you know a long, long time. Um, so the decision to uh, to move in a four-star uh, joint task force commander was really based on the release of the radiation. At the point where we had a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, operation in place uh, in the first 24 to 48 hours, uh, we thought we had uh, at least the logistics and means in order to provide uh, support to the self-defense force who took the lead on, on actual interaction with the population. We came in to support them. We recognized that if we were going to have a close working relationship in this kind of environment, that we needed a very different command and control structure than the typical traditional hierarchical one where one group works for another. That simply was not going to, that was not going to work. So instead of trying to organize and align ourselves vertically, we went horizontal. Instead of unity of command, we wanted unity of purpose so that we could work side by side with the self-defense force and the ministries in order to respond to a situation that was continuing to progress. By 72 hours or so, we realized we have a, we have a, a nuclear problem, and, and we start moving uh, Joint Task Force 519, which is a responsibility I held, dual had it as the commander of the Pacific Fleet, to respond to contingencies in Asia Pacific. So we had... Uh, command and control structure, organization, exercises, and relationships that simply uh, picked up out of Hawaii and moved into Yokota, uh, Japan, to set up shop there along with the 5th Air Force and U.S. Forces Japan. That organization was designed to, to really take care of the U.S.-Japan strategic relationship. We brought in operational capability along with the self-defense force. And the first reaction when we landed on the ground was how far behind we were. Uh, because it just seemed like the radiation was going everywhere. People were in a state of panic as they watched now the Fukushima 50 grab anything they could in their hand and go after the reactors to the point where they were taking sand trying to get the reaction uh, chained to, to slow down or to cool down. So the, the effort that we undertook was to build a common operating picture, to understand where the radiation was and where it was going. That meant uh, airborne measurement systems that would fly almost like a lawnmower back and forth in a very uh, closed pattern around Fukushima, trying to take pictures of the ground to determine where the radiation was. It was clear at the moment of the explosion in, in, um, in all three cases that there were high winds that were coming out of one direction. And so the radius that, um, that was illuminated by that uh, had a spike in the uh, direction of the northwest where we could, we could see there was going to be long-term impact to the people in that area. So uh, the first critical point that we had to make was to understand where uh, the lethal areas were and where the danger areas were and to notify individuals as well as uh, the self-defense force as to how to protect themselves and how to operate in terms of moving people and equipment out of that area. The next uh, decision point was the recognition that as trucks and, and people were moving around in the region, they were tracking radiation with them. So um, we would have occasional releases coming from uh, inside the plant in order to relieve the temperature conditions. Those releases would go into the atmosphere. The atmosphere would carry the radiation material, isotopes, uh, onto the ground. It would infiltrate into the water supply and the food supply, and then it would get trucked around inadvertently all around uh, Japan. So we had a problem that was continuing to grow. The concern by many was whether or not they needed to evacuate because it was uh, with each release of radiation, there was increasing recognition that this situation was starting to move out of control. And uh, the concern was that people were concerned for their lives and their families if they continued to stay. And what, what helped turn um, the situation was the sharing of information. So if you were to look closely at the ministries, um, METI published actual radiation readings throughout the country. So they had sensors all around 
um, the, um, the country and they would report that live so that we could see how much iodine and cesium was in the atmosphere. And, and that would help us develop an operating picture to know, okay, um, what do we need to be worried about and what do we need to be uh, concerned about but less immediate sort of actions required. The scenario we were trying to avoid is one where people started to queue up waiting for buses or ships and ex had themselves inadvertently exposed outside to the elements, absorbing radiation, the very radiation they were trying to avoid. So uh, we put through the Department of Energy uh, equipment and sensors around Fukushima that would determine lethal radiation first. And then in addition to working with the ministries in Japan, we were able to develop an understanding of where the radiation was and where it was not. We were able to convey that information to the self-defense force because the goal that we had was anticipating the next aftershock, 1,500 altogether. Um, but anticipating the next aftershock and anticipating the next release of radiation and then the kind of notification it would take to get people out of the downwind area when that radiation would blow over. So once we were able to build that kind of picture and then to bring in certain capabilities from the United States, we were able to quietly leave. Josh, uh, the last question. Right. Yeah, this is the last question, yeah. Sorry, I uh, stole your... Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, it's extremely interesting to um, sort of hear your uh, insights and compare and contrast uh, what I know about the Canadian relationship with Japan, having served there in the late 90s, um, and, uh, and also the experience of uh, Japanese Canadians um, over the years. Um, my stepmother is from uh, Iwakishi in uh, Fukushima, Ken. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, we know, and, and her mother was there through 311 as well. So we know very well the experience of, uh, uh, of the family and, uh, and those that, that were close to uh, what was happening. Um, what I heard was uh, extremely uh, uh, good information about the history of both on the political and on the um, security side. Uh, I wonder if there, you could make a comment about the economic relationship, the commercial relationship. Um, obviously, that's a, an area of great interest to me and, of course, to the region here. And as we go forward um, into uh, a TPP um, altogether, um, this is uh, this is something that I think is uh, is going to tie us even closer together um, as three countries. So, uh, along with the rest of that that region. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I try that. Yeah. I would only say one small thing, given the time too. Um, of course, you know, U.S. and Japan economic relations. These are important economic partners in all domains. And uh, if you're interested in actually a breakdown of what it means in terms of the economic and trade between each of the U.S. states and Japan, there's an excellent series produced by the East-West Center. You can see it on their website. And they're being updated right now. In fact, I do hope to get the author to come out here and talk about it because it really breaks it down to like, what is our Texas relationship in economic trade with Japan? And similar series have also been done for U.S., Korea, U.S., Australia, breaking each down by the state. So you go to that series, you get all the numbers you're looking for. We've watched um, the challenge, at least on the, uh, at least in the, on the uh, political side, to get the, um, the uh, Trans-Pacific um, Authority passed through a Congress. Um, you know, it's very nice that it's actually the Tower Center that's sponsoring this program, um, because Senator Tower and my late husband uh, were colleagues in the U.S. Senate. And I often think that if they were both here, that some of the dysfunctionality of Congress um, would, would not be as uh, severe. They were colleagues that believed in bipartisanship and, and um, the importance of really looking to see what the job was that they ne needed to get done. Um, I, I was in Japan just this past weekend and um, was in a series of me meetings, including with the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister. Uh, and uh, so clearly the, it, it's critical for both countries, and I'm really hopeful that we are going to be able to get to, um, to uh, see um, the uh, partnership 
um, come to pass. I think especially for places like Texas, and as I mentioned, I think one of the things that I felt really is important going forward is that we build those regional relationships from an economic standpoint as well as the, the other parts of the a relationship, and there's no question that as I said, that the investments that are being made here um, really from both uh, sides is going to be critical and uh, that there, um, uh, I think from all our predictions, um, there is a, a tremendous potential of gain in the economy, jobs, um, if, we can get, if we can get past this, uh, this current hurdle. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, we will see passage. Um, only to comment that uh, the TPP was a topic that uh, people were talking about um, several years ago, and and I really don't see how we can move forward without that kind of authority and without that kind of relationship. Well, one thing I would add is uh, uh, imagine what would happen when the TPP doesn't make it, and uh, especially. Um, uh, well, economic uh, impact uh, has been uh, uh, discussed, but uh, more importantly, I would say, the strategic and security uh, impact. Um, as um, Pat says, um, China is challenging U.S.-led international order. If U.S. cannot impose, propose U.S.-led international order and what it is, then China's influence will expand. And then that, I don't think that is a good thing. So. Um, that's actually the very shortest answer I can make for very um, complicated topic, which needs a long answer usually. <laughs> um, okay, um, for, uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, so uh, let's um, uh, uh, conclude the official session here. Uh, so please join me for um, applauding the uh, panelists. <laughs>